there's a story in the canon where King Basanity comes to see the Buddha in the middle of the day. And the Buddha asks him, where are you coming from in the middle of the day? The king says, oh, I've been meeting with my ministers and talking about the sorts of things that people obsessed with their power talk about. Which is a remarkably frank statement. You can imagine a press conference where a president is asked, what have you been doing today? And he said, talking about the things that people obsessed with power talk about. The Buddha asked the king, suppose someone were to come from the east, say this enormous mountain is moving in from the east, crushing all living beings in its path. Another person were to come from the south and said, there's another mountain coming from the south, crushing all living beings in its path. Another person comes from the west, the person comes from the north. There's a mountain moving in from the west and another mountain moving down from the north. All four mountains crushing all living beings in their path. The Buddha then asked, suppose that there was this great destruction of human life. When you think about how rare it is to gain a human birth, what would you do? And the king said, well, what else could I do but practice the Dharma, train the mind, do good? And the Buddha said, well, I announced to you, death is moving in, crushing all living beings in its path. So what are you going to do? And the king says, well, what else can you do but practice the Dharma? We look at the situation in the world right now, and it's, there's a lot to be worried about. But we can be confident about one thing, that the best way to respond to whatever the situation is in the world is to practice the Dharma, to be generous, to be virtuous, and to meditate, to train the mind. Because whether the situation of the world is good or bad, there's always aging, illness, and death. There's no point where the world is so totally free of insecurity. That you can really trust that the situation is going to be good, even if the economy is great. Everybody agrees to lay down their arms. People are skilled, still going to get sick, still going to get old, still going to die. But the empowering thing in all this is that your actions do shape the world in which you experience, the world you experience, the world that you're experiencing now and on into the future. And so no matter what anybody else does, you always want to practice the Dharma to hold by your ideals, to hold by your principles. Because you create your world through your actions. One of the misunderstandings we pick up from the media is that the important decisions in our world are made by other people over whom we have no control. But it is a fact that even though we're sitting here in the same room, each of us lives in a different world. And the world of our experience is created by our actions. We're the ones who are creating it and continue to create it with our actions each moment. So basically, you're in charge of your world. Now, you're not a monad who's totally independent from influences from outside. But the choices you make are the ones that shape your life. And if you make wise choices, generous choices, you protect yourself and you protect other people. On the surface it may sound selfish, but here you are trying to make sure your little world is okay. But the only way you can make sure your little world is okay is to act in a way that you're not harming anybody else. And influences spread around. If you act in a noble way, even in the midst of danger and destruction, it's a good example to other people. 
and other people want to join in. Because it's not really worth much being a human being if it's all just scrambling after wealth, scrambling after things that other people have to be deprived of. The Buddha saw this prior to going out practicing. He said the world was like a puddle that was drying up, and there were all these fish in the puddle fighting for that little last bit of water. He found it really dismaying. That kind of life is not a human life, it's an animal life. Human life is that regardless of what the situation is outside, you realize you shape your world through your actions. And the actions that shape a good world are ones that are honorable, compassionate, wise. And you can hold to that principle. Some people were commenting today that the crowd here was one of the gentlest crowds they'd ever seen. Because we're a crowd that came together because we wanted to do good, to be generous, and to rejoice in one another's generosity. This is something that's been typical of the Buddhist tradition ever since the very beginning. Back in the 19th century, when People were beginning to read some of the Buddhist texts, and all they could read about was suffering, death, age, illness. They wrote Buddhism off as a very pessimistic religion. But then they went to Asia and they saw that Buddhists in general were very happy people. The temple fairs, the various observances in the course of the year were always very happy gatherings. And they came to the conclusion that Buddhists didn't understand their own religion. If they really understood what the Buddha taught, they'd be morose and horribly depressed. But instead, they were happy. So they came up with a theory of what they called the great tradition versus the little tradition, i.e. the great tradition being what was in the text and the little tradition being Buddhism on the ground. But what they really missed was the central message, which is that your happiness is in your hands. And true happiness comes from behaving in a way that's totally harmless, and not just harmless in the sense that you're not going to hurt other people, but also that you're also going to positively do good. And generosity is a, an important part of the path. And so in this way, the Buddhist message is empowering. You can create a happy life by acting in ways that are noble and good. And you see this in the Buddhist tradition all the way from the time of the Buddha's funeral. Even though the Buddha had just passed away, there was singing and dancing at his funeral in honor of him. And many of the people were sad that he'd gone, but they lived in honor of the fact that there had been such a wonderful human being in the world. And you read about the temple fairs from the very early centuries. It was very happy occasions. Because everyone got together to do good. And social caste didn't mean anything. Everybody was working together, helping in line with their talents and their abilities. So it is possible to create a good society when everyone gathers around the principle that true happiness comes from being harmless, being helpful training the mind. That's empowering. And you don't have to have political power in the world outside. You have the power to create your own world right here, right now, through your actions. One thing that would frequently strike me when I was in Thailand, be on my arms round and walk past a little tiny grass shack, just big enough for two people to sleep in. And sure enough, there were two people in the grass shack, newlywed couple, still very poor. And someone would run out of the house and want to put something in my bowl. When you're the beneficiary of a 
the generosity of poor people. It really goes to the heart. I come back from my arms around and tell myself, you can't be lazy today. A poor person has been generous with you. Because the Buddha's teachings off gives that opportunity to be generous, to be virtuous to everybody, regardless of their position in the world. Everybody, no matter how rich or poor you may be, no matter what society may think of you, you have the ability to train your mind. And you can shape your world through that power. The teachings talk about becoming. It's basically your sense of the world in which you live and your identity within that world. And it's based on your actions. That's the field in which a particular sense of the world can grow. You keep on doing things that you know are good, and that creates a good field. The possibilities in that field are always replenished. And that's something that's totally within your power. The world at large may have political strife, economic collapse, All kinds of negative things may be happening, but in your world you're creating a good world, and you're not the only one that's benefiting from that. This is why we train the mind, regardless of what the situation is outside. Because by training the mind we're shaping the world. The world in which we live and the world in which the people around us live as well. So even though the mountains of aging, illness, and death may be moving in, we can still train the mind. Because the Buddha pointed, it, pointed out that death is not the end. It's one instance or one incident in a very long story. Poverty is not the end. Famine, you know, the four horsemen, they're not really the end. The four horsemen are been stampeding all over the world for who knows how long. But we can still do good. And in doing good we protect ourselves in that like in that passage we chanted just now. Your protection lies in the good that you do. There was another time when King Basenity went to see the Buddha. And he commented that the more he thought about it, the more he realized that people who act in harmful ways and what they do and what they say and what they think, they don't really protect themselves. They don't really love themselves. They leave themselves open to attack and all from all sides. The people who are well protected are the ones who behave well in thought and word and deed. For that kind of protection you don't need an army. As the Buddha said in the Dhammapada, if your hand doesn't have a wound, then you can pick up poison and not get poisoned by it, not be harmed by it, because you haven't done the sort of thing that would leave an opening for the poison to get into you. In the same way, when you train your mind, you're giving protection to others and you're giving protection to yourself as well. And it's this way that we can live together in peace and harmony. So in a day like this, when people have come together to do good, it's something we should rejoice in. Because that rejoicing helps to remind us of where true happiness lies. <laughs>